Morning. 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 There you go. All right, good. Uh, so what I wanted to talk to you about this morning is uh, my discovery of how deep the rabbit hole goes if you're open to new experiences and if you are a little bit ignorant about what you're getting into. So my story starts in the summer of 2006. I was working in corporate jobs. I was trying to get corporations to kind of do good things. And it was kind of going well, but I felt kind of frustrated. I felt like it wasn't everything that it could be. Um, and along the lines, I was working at GE, uh, and I'd met this organization called Acumen Fund. Um, and I called up the woman that I had met there, to, not really to ask her specifically for a job, but just to ask her for some ideas. And she said to me, um, and, and what I'd known about Acumen was really what we, the way we had connected with them uh, through GE. We had a water business, and I knew Acumen did some work in water, as well as um, work in healthcare. And I knew also they did some work in housing, all of this in the developing world to fight poverty. And uh, the woman I spoke to uh, said, well, they were actually looking for someone to head up their fundraising. And this is something that I really didn't know anything about. Um, and I asked a mentor of mine what he thought of the idea of working in fundraising at a nonprofit. And he basically told me to run as quickly as I could in the other direction. Um, and, and then I started to look around to see, well, you know, are fundraising jobs jobs that people want or not? And so you can go on the job board of Chronicle Philanthropy or kind of any other organization. Needless to say, when you look for a fundraising job, there's lots of opportunities. You can see the numbers right here. But the strange thing is if you look up executive jobs or leadership jobs or program jobs, which are supposed to be the opposite of fundraising, it's all sort of a three to one ratio, because these are jobs that nobody wants to take. The second reason I was pretty sure I shouldn't take the job was because Acumen had this crazily ambitious goal of raising $100 million. Um, the most they'd ever raised in a given year was $12 million. And since I firmly believe that people are really bad at visualizing really, really big numbers, I thought a visual representation might help you. So, <laughs> so it's a really, really big number. Uh, and the third thing was that I had actually never raised a single dollar in my life. Uh, not one. And more importantly, what I knew about myself, or I thought that I knew, was that I wasn't a sales guy. Um, everybody who I knew was a salesperson was the kind of person who would work a 12-hour day and then kind of get back to the hotel and say, you know, I got to go to the bar and kind of meet some new people. And all I wanted to do was go back to my hotel room and like pick up a good book. Um, but what I thought was maybe if the thing that I was trying to sell, or more importantly, the story that I was trying to share, was something really important and really close to my heart, that maybe I could make that leap. Uh, and in truth, there was a time in my life where I really felt like I needed to take some sort of leap. And so I did take that leap, and I took the job. And um, our CEO and founder is a woman named Jacqueline Novogratz. Um, she's a real visionary. And for the first six months, she kept on telling me that what we were going to do was we were reinventing fundraising. And I kept on looking at her and nodding and thinking, I have the slightest idea what we were reinventing. Um, and so I figured the best thing I could do is just get started. And so I started to tell our story. And our story is a story of what we call patient capital. The idea is that we are a charity. We raise philanthropic money, and then we turn around and invest it in businesses that serve the poor in the developing world. In the simplest way, what we're trying to do is take some of the principles of business and apply them to the problems of social change, um, which, again, when you describe it in that way, sounds simple and maybe straightforward. But the environments in which we're working are incredibly, incredibly difficult. Um, the infrastructure, like this road, is practically non-existent. The customers we're trying to serve are people like this woman, Elizabeth, who's a customer of one of our companies in Western Kenya, whose experience is interacting with markets that basically don't work. Um, and then trying to have that person be a customer, for serving them, giving them a reliable product, um, is much more challenging than it would otherwise be. And then probably most importantly is trust is incredibly hard to come by. So this is what's called a ghost school in Pakistan. So it had uh, three years of grant funding, and then the funding runs out. And then what you have is not a school, but just an empty building. So the expectation is that things don't work or that things don't last. But on the other hand, in that context, um, what was happening is our companies that we were investing in at Acumen Fund were really um, having a great deal of success. So let me tell you just one of those stories to give you a little bit of what that means. So in 2006, uh, in, in the city of Mumbai in India, which is a city of 15 million people, if you had any kind of emergency at all, there was no emergency number to call. You couldn't call 911 or its equivalent. And so if, God forbid, something happened to you, you, know, you could take an auto rickshaw um, to the hospital. Or you could take, in fact, there were some ambulances in the city, but nine out of 10 ambulance rides were transporting dead bodies. And you can actually see this says coffin box on the side. Um, 
And the entrepreneurs that we uh, came across were two gentlemen who had been uh, successful in the past. They had a fleet of nine ambulances, and their goal was to grow that fleet of nine ambulances to 70 ambulances. Um, and we made a million and a half dollar investment in them as a, in the company to help them do that. The ambulances were modeled on the London Ambulance Service, um, so they had high quality life-saving equipment on board. Um, and with their 70 ambulances, um, they were able to build a fleet and use uh, you know, Google technology and, and call centers so that an ambulance would come to anywhere in the city uh, within 10 to 15 minutes. And the model was one where there would be a cross subsidy. So if you were wealthy and you went to a fancy hospital, they charge you full price. And if you were, wanted to go to one of the public hospitals, it would either be half price or even free. And the motto of this company was an access for all service. Um, so they grew to 70 ambulances, um, and many of you will remember that in November of 2008, there was a terrorist attack on the Taj Hotel, um, and 1298 was the first responder to this attack. So they actually pulled 125 people out of the building, and you can imagine the impact that has on the psyche of a city um, when you have that level of service um, that you can bring to your citizens. Since then, they've continued to grow. 1298 has now nearly 900 ambulances across six states in India. They've answered more than one million phone calls, and their 4,500 employees makes them the fifth largest ambulance company, not in India, but actually in the world. And this is just one of the companies that Acumen Fund has invested in that's really having kind of a massive impact on long-standing social problems, whether it's this company here that's providing power in northern India off, off the grid using biomass, a company in, uh, also in India that's doing uh, water in rural areas. Nearly four million people have access to safe and clean drinking water. A company in Tanzania that's producing bed nets that protect people from malaria now represents about 15% of the global market. They produce nearly 30 million bed nets a year. Or most recently in Nigeria, where 70% of the drugs are counterfeit, we've just recently invested in a company called Sproxil, which is putting these little sticky tabs on the back of your blister pack, and you send a text message, and within 30 seconds, you find out whether or not your drugs are counterfeit. So the idea is really to find companies that are having an innovative approach to solving a problem and help them grow really big. Um, what we're trying to do is say, historically, to solve social problems, you had philanthropy, which is kind of very good um, at one set of things, but then you've got the market, on the other hand, which is very good at efficiency. And our question has really been, can you combine the best of philanthropy and the best of the markets, the best of generosity, if you will, and accountability, and by using this patient capital as an investor with social aims, can you make kind of massive social change? So we work in uh, India and Pakistan and East and West Africa. And the 100 million uh, uh, funds that we were trying to raise was basically to grow from a small startup organization with $15 million invested uh, to $100 million invested by the end of 2012. So it was a pretty powerful story for us. And um, by September 2008, we had gotten a lot of the way along reaching this $100 million fundraising goal. And I felt like also I was beginning to find my own voice within sort of this organization and within this space. And particularly where it all started to come together for me was on a plane ride from, uh, from, New York to San, uh, from San Francisco to New York. Um, I'd been on the road for about 30 days straight. Um, I was just coming from a conference. I had kind of written every last email I could. I thanked everybody. I sort of couldn't do any more. And I shut my computer. And I picked up a book that was new at the time, a book called Tribes by Seth Godin. Um, and the subtitle of Tribe is, we, lead, we Need You to Lead Us. So there I am sitting, reading this book, kind of plowing through. And on page 102 of Tribes, it says, you should write a manifesto. And that's the kind of thing that I think at any other moment in my life I would have read. And I would have thought, that seems like a good idea. Like, maybe I should do that someday. Um, but since I was there, kind of nothing else to do, I popped open my computer, and I wrote a manifesto. And what the manifesto was called was In Defense of Raising Money a manifesto for nonprofit CEOs. And I began to figure out what the problem really was with fundraising. And the problem, as I saw it, was that fundraising always starts with an apology. So fundraising starts with an imbalance between the person who's asking for money and the person who has money, a sense that what I'm doing today is worth less than maybe what you've done in the past. And so I put this down on paper, and I think it, it captured a lot of people's sentiment about what was wrong, um, what was wrong with the way we were approaching these problems. And I got really interested in this question of money. I think what's at the core of this challenge of fundraising is that we allow the way that the power that money has over us and the way that we allow money to define us and how we relate to it. And I got really interested in this question of money and how it kind of works throughout history. So I went all the way back to the, to the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, it's very clear that the way you treat money with people who are kind of part of your tribe is different from the people who are outside of your tribe. So outside of your tribe, to a foreigner, you may charge interest. But to your brother, you shall not charge interest. So the way I think of this is you've got kind of your tribe, if you will, and then strangers. 
And inside your tribe, what you have is a gift economy. And outside your tribe, you have commerce. And then if you go through lots of cultures throughout history, you see a similar uh, emphasis on the role of gifts in creating sort of social fabric. So this is a uh, image of a potlatch ceremony of the Native Americans in uh, Northwest United States. So a potlatch ceremony was basically a, called a wealth extinguishing ceremony. So the wealthiest people in the tribe would get everybody together and throw this massive party basically to extinguish their wealth and to give it away to other people in the tribe. The most interesting example I found was from, from, from Papua New Guinea. Um, there's something called the Kula Ring. And so the way the Kula Ring works is you've got these necklaces and these armbands. And each of them travels in a different direction around this, uh, this archipelago of islands. They'll literally travel hundreds of miles. So the way it works is um, you never give or receive uh, to the same person. So you give in one direction, and you receive in the other direction. You can imagine these gifts literally traveling in this massive circle over you know, many miles and many years. Um, and it teaches you a lot about what the characteristic of a gift is. So a gift doesn't have inherent value. A gift has a value you put into it. Um, the, value, the nature of a gift is that it circulates. Um, and the value of a gift can change over time as it passes through more and more hands. But I was just fascinated by all this importance of gift giving uh, in, in all these cultures. But of course, what's happened over time is that the space for gift giving has gotten really, really small, and the place for commerce has gotten really big. And what I found ironic was I had actually come to Acumen Fund because I thought that this was a really good thing, and I still feel it's a really good thing, this notion of let's bring the notion of business to, to solving a social problem. But then on a personal level, something really wasn't fitting for me. You know, with respect to the work we were doing at Acumen Fund, I felt more informed than I had ever been, more aware, educated, connected, you name it. But in terms of my own personal practice, here I was working in a social change organization, and I wasn't getting any more generous. And if anything, what was happening was the more that I knew about how hard it was to make social change, the higher the bar was getting. So if somebody would come to me, you know, can you donate to this, can you give that, it was like nothing felt good enough. So while I would think that I would be getting kind of more and more generous over time, what I was actually doing was saying no to more and more things. This came home to roost for me one day in December of 2009. Um, I live outside New York City, uh, and I commute on the train every day. Uh, and the train runs on a very sort of strict schedule, so I'm constantly on the subway, like staring at my phone, uh, counting down the minutes. Um, and on this particular day, a gentleman came up to, to me and everyone else on the subway car and asked for money. And I did what I typically do in that situation, and maybe you do as well, which is that I said no. And somehow this one really hit me in the gut, and it didn't feel right to me. And I began to reflect, well, how often am I saying no in my life? Or is it four out of five times? Or maybe nine out of ten times? You know, pretty soon I felt like the no's were starting to take over. And the no's were defining how I reacted when someone came to me to ask for help. And it felt to me like I had the opportunity to start practicing saying yes. And so I ran home and kind of uh, impulsively put up a post on my blog that said that I was going to launch a month-long generosity experiment. And the idea of the generosity experiment was incredibly simple. I would spend an entire month saying yes to absolutely everything. Whether it's somebody asking me for money on the street, a street musician, to tip generously, if somebody was asking for help at work. Um, what I was thinking I could do and I only kind of figured this out afterwards, was what if I could just kind of supercharge my practice of generosity, and maybe that would reset uh, my level, and make being generous a default. So rather than having to go through the world and say, today I'm going to be generous, what if my default were to be generous, and I had to decide not to be generous? And how would that change my orientation? So I did the experiment for a month. I learned a lot. We could talk more about that. But this is where the sort of how deep the rabbit hole goes really starts for me. So what I saw was, I don't know how many of you, I think a lot of folks here are parents. But when I became a parent, one of the things I noticed is before being a parent, I didn't see babies or kids or strollers anywhere. And then after becoming a parent, you know, it's like they're absolutely everywhere. And this is sort of what happened to me um, with respect to generosity. I was seeing it everywhere, and I, and I felt like I needed to do more with it and put, um, put this idea out into the world. So we got ahead to um, February of 2011. I was speaking on a panel uh, at Social Media Week in New York with uh, Scott Case, who runs Malaria No More, Katja Andreessen from Network for Good, and Ellen McGirt. And somehow we all seem to talk like this. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and so um, I got to talking with Katja after, after the panel. And I was thinking about my generosity experiment because of some of the things we talked about. And I said, well, what if we did a generosity day? And Katya said, well, I think that's a great idea, and I think we should do it on Valentine's Day. And I had this vague sense that, that, um, that Valentine's Day was coming up soon. And in fact, we were having this conversation on Friday, February 11th. 
at 11 in the morning. So we had two days, two weekend days before uh, Valentine's Day was coming. And I said, you know, I think we missed the opportunity. Uh, you know, we should do it next year. And Katya said, no, no, I think we should do it now. And so we decided to do it now. I ran back to the office and put up another blog post. And it said, this Monday, we're going to reboot Valentine's Day as Generosity Day, one day of sharing love with everyone, of being generous to everyone, to see how it feels to practice saying yes, because we can do better than smarmy greeting cards, overpriced roses, and stressed out couples trying to create romantic meals on the fly. So we put this word out there to a bunch of folks. Uh, we got an article written in Fast Company about it. And over the weekend, it started to pick up momentum. So more and more, police, uh, more and more uh, outlets were picking it up. Um, over the course of three days, we had 53 articles that were written, more than 4,000 tweets with the Generosity Day hashtag, which we had created, and more than 3 million views uh, of, of this idea. We had Nick Kristoff write about it, Alyssa Milano, uh, Christy Turlington. And so we did it. We created a day. We created Generosity Day. Um, we did it again this past year. We had about three times uh, the impact. I could tell you lots of great stories, but the one that I kind of loved the most was from the Rainmaker Foundation, uh, a charity in the UK. And this woman actually went around London passing out croissant to people and, and just wishing them a happy generosity day. Um, and I, I kept on thinking, what is it about this concept? Because we really didn't have any thrust behind it. We didn't spend a single dollar on it. Why do people all over the world start behaving generous all of a sudden? It's not like anybody was looking over their shoulder and asking them or telling them or watching them uh, to make them behave differently. And I think it was because we gave them permission. So like the Kula ring, or like any of these other uh, traditional societies, um, there was, we created space and we created a new set of norms for a very short period of time and gave people a sense of membership in something that was bigger than themselves. And all of a sudden, they became, began acting differently. And I think we have more space for this in our lives. So I'd like to ask all of you, like, what do you see when you see this picture? So what I see is a chance to like, check my email. right? So you go into all of these spaces, you go into an elevator, and it's like a chance to disconnect. And we have more and more opportunities to be disconnected from one another, when I think really our opportunity is to give gifts to one another. And I think that we can do this every day and in, every, in, in everything that we do. My reflection on a personal level was that I was, and I kind of still fight against this notion of walking through the world with a real sense of scarcity. Um, and what I learned from this generosity experiment was I would create a sense of abundance by practicing abundance and not the other way around. And so the moment uh, in my month that I remember the most was near the end of the month, I was on the same subway car. There was another guy who was asking for money, and everyone was kind of ignoring him. And I stood up, and I handed him a $20 bill. Now, $20 is not a lot of money. But at that exact moment, I literally felt my pulse Kind of my heartbeat was racing, my pulse was really high, and it just felt so against what you do in that situation. And of course, I handed the guy the money, and I kind of went on with my day, and everything was fine. Um, and there was nothing difficult about doing that except the act of doing it. And what I learned through that process is that giving really makes us happy. And not in a sort of, like, that's a nice thing to say. I mean, people have actually studied this, and they've done experiments where they give two groups of people. One group they give money, and the other group that they keep. And the other group, they give money that they give away. And it's not only that the same parts of the brain, the pleasure centers of the brain, light up for both groups, but they actually light up more for the people who give the money away. We're really hardwired for generosity, and it gives us a deep sense of happiness and belonging and satisfaction. And I think the problem is that habits, there are neural shortcuts, right? So we get into these habits, and I think the habits that we've gotten into are not only bad habits, but habits that are separating us from who we naturally are. I think we have an opportunity to create a practice of generosity in our lives. Not because generosity alone is going to solve all of our problems, because it won't. But if you just listen to the talks over the course of the week, or if you think of anything of real meaning or beauty that's been created and been made part of your life, people have put themselves into it. There is a gift that is part of that. Um, and I think that if we create that space, we'll really create change for ourselves. What I've learned on a personal level about this, and going back to the beginning, um, to fundraising, was that I, in fact, had a gift. And the real fundamental reinvention of fundraising that I needed to do was a huge mental shift to think, when I'm going to talk to somebody about the work that we're doing, this transformative work that's touched nearly 100 million lives, that's showing incredible potential to make change in the world, I am offering somebody a gift. I am offering them the chance 
to be part of something bigger. I'm offering them the chance to create meaning in their lives. I'm offering them the chance to be part of something that really has meaning for themselves and in the world. And the moment that I can understand that and remember it, and I promise you every day I have to remind myself of it, it completely shifts the dynamic of that conversation. It shifts the relationship between me and the person I'm speaking to and creates a whole new sense of possibility. And finally, just one last reflection. Um, I spent a lot of time obviously thinking about gifts and the role of giving gifts. Uh, and I couldn't help but pause along the way and think about the gifts that I've personally received and that the way that a gift can really transform you. Um, I want to close with this quotation from this great book by Lewis Hyde called The Gift. It says, the gift that has the power to change us awakens a part of the soul. But we can't receive the gift until we meet it as an equal. We therefore submit to the labor of becoming like the gift. And giving a return gift is the final act in the labor of gratitude. It's also the true acceptance of the original gift. The most powerful gifts that I've been given by colleagues and mentors or friends are ones where I had to submit myself to the labor of becoming like the gift. I had to live up to the gift and transform myself and through that act to really grow. And my hope is for today that by sharing a little bit of what I've learned about gifts and giving it away to all of you that I can actually accept the gifts that I've been given.